Um, we have been dealing uh, with big tech at this conference at large, um, and it has been uh, the prominent topic here also at this conference, but it is, of course, at, at many conferences. Uh, we have also discussed um, some competition law proceedings. Um, we have discussed why did we need something like an extra regulation? Do we need regulation? Why doesn't competition law do? Why, why is competition law not able to make markets really contestable? Why isn't it able to really protect consumers? Well, at least what we have seen, we have seen lots of legislative initiatives in the last years. We have seen Section 19A in Germany. Um, there, there have been plans for pro-competition intervention in the UK. Uh, the latest news that we have seen in the newspapers, they are not so clear about what is going to happen now in the UK indeed. But we have seen initiatives uh, in Australia. Uh, we see the American Innovation and Choice Online Act in the United States. But I think you all agree the most prominent of all of them is the Digital Markets Act, the DMA, which maybe also is something like a role model for other laws uh, throughout uh, the world. So I'm very happy to have with me uh, Dr. Andreas Schwab. He's a member of European Parliament. He is the rapporteur for the Digital Markets Act in the leading internal markets committee. Um, he took also a leading part in the trilogue between the Commission, the Council, uh, and Parliament, and he obviously had a significant role in the legislative process of the DMA. I think it's fair to say that Andreas Schwab is the most experienced competition lawmaker in the world, because the DMA hasn't been his first project in European Parliament. He has also been in charge of the ECN Plus Directive, very important for us as national competition agencies, and also of the Damages Claim Directive. So he's really experienced in how to shape uh, competition law. Dr. Schwab, good morning. Um, good morning. Warm welcome here among us. The, the DMA negotiations were concluded in, in, in less than one and a half years, I think. That is also a record uh, for legislative process. So if you look at it in retrospect now, um, uh, which, which accomplishments are you particularly proud of? Uh, what has European Parliament achieved vis-a-vis -vis the draft uh, that has come up from the Commission? You haven't changed too much, but there have been some significant changes. So what do you like and what would you have liked to achieve? Well, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, what I would like have to achieve the, is um, more or less what we have. There are some elements, but if you allow me, before to come to these elements, to make a comment, um, you were very kind, saying that um, 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 lawmaking in competition policy is important. But uh, with all the respect, I think making the law is far easier than applying it. And therefore, um, the merits go definitely to you and to your colleagues if uh, the preparation of these laws has been helping you to apply them better, uh, then we were doing a good service. Uh, but uh, making a competition policy laws is easier than applying them. We hear it. And that's the reason why I'm um, very satisfied with the DMA so far, because I can invent everything, uh, and you cannot contradict me. It will be brilliant. <laughs> it is the best law ever, and you will see how easy it is to apl be applied. But, <laughs> but having said that, I think there, are, there is one general concern that we had. It's a very retrospective approach. With, the, uh, with the Articles 5 and 6 as a tool, for sure most of the beef there is about past cases. Mm -hmm. Therefore, colleagues were all the time concerned that it has to be more future-proof. I think that, and this was my personal commitment, we did a lot to improve transparency of advertising markets. And you see that the Commission feels already under stress because they uh, want to catch up with classical tools before the DMA enters into force. Um, and I'm very proud of it because it's an important uh, question for democracy and also for, for the public opinion how uh, transparency in advertising can be played out. The second element for future proofing is all these ideas of opening markets with regulatory tools. Uh, this has not been my initial idea, but we, in the end we have been defending it. 
and we will have to see how much opening there will be in the area of messaging services because obviously um, the, the, the tool of these services is the interconnection with other core platform services. So rather there might be newcomers, new market entrants that want to take that opportunity instead of old ones uh, connecting, but that remains to be seen. It's technically quite complicated, um, but um, it's an option in any event to open up these markets. And um, the, the most future-proof elements are definitely in Article 6. I think it will be a, 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 an opportunity. I could have also said the challenge, but as I'm speaking to you now, I should be very positive. It will be an opportunity to define what negative self-preferencing means. Um, and I think it, it's also an example where the Commission, that is the sole enforcer of this law in Europe, can prove um, how much power this regulatory dialogue will bring. And finally, um, I would have wished that the front conditions that are difficultly uh, to be applied, I know, but that the front conditions would have been uh, put in the scope on all core platform services and not only on App Store, social media, and um, search. Um, but um, we will have to see how this plays out. In the end, um, it's also national courts that can apply this, and therefore we will, be, we will have to wait uh, how you finally apply this brilliant law. <laughs> Great responsibility from the start. <laughs> um, Mr. Schwab, uh, we, we talked a lot about cooperation here among us in, in order to tame big tech because we think this is not something that can be done in Brussels or in Washington or in Bonn or somewhere else. Uh, uh, it, it, it is a joint work for us as competition agencies or as regulators, whoever is going to do that. So if you look at, at, at Europe, um, and maybe you can draw the scope even beyond that, um, what do you think is the future role for us as national competition agencies in Europe vis-a-vis -vis the European Commission? Of course, we can apply Article 101, 102. We, we can apply at least along the law. Uh, we can apply um, national competition law. So what do you think is the role of traditional competition law? What role is it going to play? And in this context, what is the role of the national competition agencies? You know, we would have wished also to have enforcement powers in, uh, with regard to the DMA. We didn't achieve that um, in the negotiations. But what is our future task in that? And um, what, 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 what is the relationship, in a way, between a regulatory law like the DMA and traditional competition law um, in the future? I wouldn't say that the DMA is regulatory law. It's internal market legislation uh, that is inspired by the basic principles what this market is about. And it's about freedom um, to start a business, freedom to acquire a market, and freedom uh, to become a business leader. And this is ultimately also part of our democratic uh, basics. So therefore, your institutions play an important role to make sure that uh, Europe remains open as an economy. And I'm very grateful that um, um, our French colleague um, has confirmed yesterday again that the story that I'm always repeating is, is correct, that the Germans have started that after the Second World War as a law to make sure that the society cannot be closed by economic monopolies. Because there is an interaction between society and the economy, and if you make sure, and that's your task in all the member states, to keep economies open, then you do the best also to keep societies open. And there is a special link to big tech because they are very close uh, uh, in the area of public opinion um, and also uh, in lots of consumer business related um, uh, situations. And we need openness there. We need open markets there. And there is no one that is that close to these situations than uh, the national uh, competition authorities. You are a community of brilliant people that are discussing on the merits. Um, and in politics, that's not always the case. Because in politics, you know that, and I say that with all the respect uh, to you and to us. For us, it's not important to be right. It doesn't matter. For us, it's important to get majorities. 
you can discuss on the basis of what is right and what is wrong, and therefore you have a, an advantage on this, um, but there is also a higher responsibility with it. But we have to try to make sure that in public uh, policy uh, cooperation and, uh, um, and, and uh, in the public um, field, it's clear that what we want to do is not only getting majorities, but also getting it right. And I think in that area so far, we have managed quite well to find the right balance. Mr. Schwab, um, it's not the first time that we meet and uh, discuss the DMA. Be before it was agreed upon, there was a long discussion about the inclusion of, of, um, of national competition agencies. Also, under the headline, is the DMA really self-enforcing or does it need significant resources um, to enforce it? If I had been Margrethe Vestager uh, uh, all the time, I would have said, well, this is a great piece of legislative uh, work, but it is anything but self-enforcing. And if you want me to enforce it, I need at least 200 people or 300 people to do that. Now, it's been the other way around. It's supposed to be self-enforcing. So what is your expectation now for the, for, for the future? Do you think um, that big tech says, oh, the DMA is in place? I must be compliant now, and that it is all self-enforcing, or do you expect, well, enforcement action by the European Commission, plus do you expect litigation uh, afterwards before the European courts? Well, whatever they say, they have to apply it. So that doesn't matter. We should not speculate about what they think. It's the law. They have to uh, apply it. And if I was Margarete Vestager, but I'm not, I would have tried to merge not only material law at EU level, but also procedural law. Because it, to a certain extent, it's a shame or a frustration that between uh, Lisbon, uh, Bonn, and Paris, you apply exactly the same law, but you have to look for different proofs. Because in Portugal, you may need a paper of that side. Uh, in the Germany, you may need a, an oral testimonial from that. And you cannot exchange the, the proofs. It's, uh, it's not logical, uh, and that is, I think, an important shortcoming that we should make sure that national and European authorities can really work not only on the same base of material, but also on uh, procedural law. Um, and you are probably the, the foremost area in European law where we could try this, um, and that would have helped also the cooperation to be much easier. Now, um, self-enforcing is, I think, in the words of Margarete Vestager, rather a call to companies that they have to apply the law directly. However, that will be difficult in any event in the areas of Article 6, um, as I touched already upon front and on, uh, on self-preferencing. There are no clear definitions of what that means. So I have always thought that um, the, the process of regulatory dialogue will be the tool for the Commission to create some sort of power uh, broking with these companies to make sure that what they uh, should do in Article 5 can be strengthened by Article 6 um, and, uh, and the other way around. And therefore, I think there is some sort of um, um, enforcement task, but this enforcement task is um, easier if the companies have to know that the rules are there already be before speaking to the Commission, and that it's not the Commission running behind them. But you know that I'm of the opinion that we need more uh, power uh, for the Commission on that, more manpower. Um, and also for this, that cooperation with national authorities could be very useful. Um, but also member states have to beef up um, their investments in that area. And I, I can only call on you also to convince your governments that it's important in Europe that national authorities keep the markets open. This cannot be done by the European Union. This is uh, something that everyone has to do at home first. Mr. Schwab, we, we see legislative initiatives around the world. I said that already. Germany is quite advanced. Um, Section 19A is in place already for a year. Again, I think the DMA is the most prominent piece of work in this respect. So, if you take a look beyond Europe, do you think that the DMA could be a role model for, for other areas in the world? I mean, we have no idea what is really going to happen in terms of legislation in the United States. 
Um, to see what is going to happen in the UK, to me at least, is completely unclear after the latest reports that I have read. But do you think that we can export the DMA to a certain extent, just as we have set standards in Europe by the GDPR? Well, I think we are very proud on the DMA, and most especially me. But I have to tell you that for sure our work has been strongly inspired by experiences that I have been taking from a visit to Japan where they have explained to me how they have put in place uh, the Cybersecurity Act that we did at European level and GDPR. It has been strongly influenced by the Australian fight for openness of um, democratic uh, processes in, in media. It has been influenced by a lot of other countries, not least the US, because the debate is here not so much about who is proud or who is not. The debate is about what can we do to make sure that every single human being can believe from the first day of its life to have an open chance to make it in business, in economy. Um, this is, to a certain extent, we would say the American dream, uh, but Europeans and the other parts of the world have similar ideas with similar words. But the, the ultimate question is, what do we do to make this world economically fair? And, uh, and this is a key question for the Western world, because we are uh, the, the lead model, but we are only the lead model if we show that we try our best to stay it. And therefore, this is not something that we can fix in Europe. I'm sure that other countries will maybe be a bit inspired of us. Um, I would be very happy for that. But we will also look very closely what others are doing. And just this morning, I was surprised I got an invitation to a South Korean TV uh, to explain the DMA. So there is an exchange already underway. Mr. Schwab, what are your next projects? I mean, you, you, you do so much in the European Parliament. Do we expect anything new in, in terms of competition law? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, this is, this is very kind, but it is a bit of a um, sectorial view on, on legislation. Yes. Um, what we need in Europe is a better cooperation between the national and the European level to reduce, uh, let's say, bureaucratic burdens. And this is uh, maybe very easily uh, already done in competition policy because you are all very capable. You have all a very clear understanding of the law and you can very easily separate one task from the other. In other areas of the European Union, this is much more difficult, even though we start with the principle that you have to fix the problems at home with the best manner. And if you manage this, no one should uh, interfere with you. There are so many questions nowadays of a, of a transnational global uh, uh, meaning that, that we have to be closer and to understand better how we differently interact and how we can better doing things together. And um, that will uh, remain an important element. Um, I don't know if, it's, if you will want to speak about uh, tools like single market emergency instrument because we want to take the conclusions um, out of uh, Corona and all the shortcomings that we have seen in Europe but also beyond. Um, but also here, it's a very strong uh, interplay with the European Commission, because I think we have also to give a credit to the European Commission uh, on legislation in digital, where they have been very, very strong. And this is not always the case, because you know the European Commission, and this is maybe an, a very good comment also on the question before. National competition authorities, as I said already, are deciding normally, and I think it's a very strong normally, on the merits. So you take a case, you have a look on it, and you don't consider the, the value in stock exchange, uh, the, the turn uh, over and whatever. You just look on the wrongdoing in the market. The European Commission is a unique uh, and amazing institution, but for sure um, there is an interplay also with politics there. You don't have that normally, I hope. Um, um, and uh, this is very important, but at EU level there will always be also a political assessment because ultimately it's the college that decides, mm -hmm. and we should, we should not be naive. For sure, um, there are uh, reflections of member states, for example, that uh, have a very strong support from the Americans that want to have this uh, relation uh, in a good shape. Uh, me too, by the way, but uh, there is a different reflection because I believe the good shape will be the, there even if we uh, dare to, to do what we think we have to do uh, because we are fighting for the right cause. So there should be no interference um, with other reflections that are not purely on the matter. And uh, we discussed yesterday at that uh, marvelous dinner 
uh, for which I want to thank you again, also about um, a recent transaction in, in big tech. Um, and for sure, we, we have now to observe very closely as to whether there is only the best intentions there from the investor, or if there is also other um, thoughts behind um, that might uh, be in relation with economic dependence of his other companies and whatever. We will have to observe that. And the best explanation will always be what you have to apply for your action. And like that, you can also put some pressure on the European Commission uh, to leave political reflections apart and to focus on the issues. Therefore, you have a leading role. Many thanks, Dr. Schwab. Many thanks for setting the scene for this day, this morning, and for looking a bit beyond competition law also, which is always important. A warm applause uh, for Dr. Schwab. So, ladies and gentlemen, after this uh, scene-setting quick talk, um, it's my pleasure to announce our first panel this morning that has been set up by the Agency Effectiveness Working Group. It's on how the pandemic has changed agencies' investigative process over the last um, months and years. Um, the moderator is Anton Dinev, counsel of the Grimaldi Studio Legale in Brussels. Um, Anton, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you to all the Bundeskartellamt for organizing this uh, wonderful conference. It's a great pleasure and indeed an honor to be here with you. Uh, as you said, welcome to the Agency Effectiveness Working Group uh, plenary session. Uh, we have um, today we'll be discussing an important topic, which is um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the event on the investigative processes of competition agencies. But first, uh, let me introduce our speakers. Um, next to me is uh, Lok Xiu Meng, Assistant Chief uh, Executive of the Competition and Consumer Commission of Singapore. Welcome. Um, Ms. Uh, Brent Hernandez, Acting Chairwoman of uh, the Mexican Federal Economic uh, Competition Commission. Next is um, Dr. Jagjit Singh, Commissioner of the Malaysia Competition Commission. And last, uh, Richard Jermsten, Director General of the Swedish uh, Competition Authority. As I said, today, today this plenary will address uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the investigative processes of uh, competition agencies. Uh, this topic is part of a broader ongoing project called uh, Agency Effectiveness Post-COVID-19. Uh, this project uh, is led by the Agency Effectiveness Working Group and aims to explore in particular what competition law enforcement uh, would look like after the pandemic, how the agency's institutional design and, uh, and investigative processes have been adapted to the new normal of the pandemic and what best practices or experiences uh, could be shared between ICN members in order to help them prepare for uh, future emergency uh, situations. So this panel will focus on one particular aspect of the agency's day-to-day uh, -day work, which is um, uh, investigative uh, processes. As we all know, uh, conducting effective antitrust investigations was um, greatly impacted by the health and social distancing regulations in many jurisdictions uh, during the pandemic. So it would be interesting to uh, learn more about uh, how selected agencies have approached the challenges of this uh, new normal as they continued investigating competition law violations while ensuring the health and safety of uh, their staff. It is also important to look uh, into the future after COVID-19 and try to draw lessons from uh, the agency's past experience, which could further improve and strengthen their investigative processes. Our speakers, senior officials of um, agencies across the globe, will tell us a little more about specific challenges their agencies have, um, uh, have faced while conducting antitrust investigations during the pandemic, how they approached them, uh, what solutions worked out and what did not, 
and which investigative tools and practices they would like to keep and use in the future. So our panel discussion today is organized around uh, three questions, same for all of you, uh, and we'll touch upon the following topics. Challenges uh, to adapting, adapting investigative processes to the new realities, um, specific issues in relation to down rates, and finally, lessons for the future. So here's my first question. Um, what are the most important or interesting challenges your agency has faced since the beginning of the pandemic? And how did you deal with them to ensure the continuity and effectiveness of inv investigative processes? Let's start with Malaysia. Dr. Jagjit, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anton. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, ICN, for all the hospitality and the wonderful dinner last night. Now, um, due to the rapid increase in the number of COVID-19 cases in March 2020, the Malaysian government had imposed a full lockdown in Malaysia. Now, the initial uh, full lockdown was for a period of three months. And subsequently, there were several phases and series of movement control order, including the declaration of an emergency order, order, as well as partial lockdowns of varying periods. Now, of course, all these lockdowns and pandemic had impacted the enforcement and investigative activities and also the investigative processes of my CC. Now, my focus this morning will be on four challenging aspects of investigations during the pandemic, which brought about changes to the investigative processes. Now, the first challenge. The first and the biggest challenge the investigating officers faced was the limitation in engagement, and in particular, face-to-face -face engagements with the relevant parties. Uh, relevant parties here include target individuals, potential witnesses, um, in order to obtain the necessary information and evidence. Now, this limitation was not solely because of the movement control orders, but also largely due to the fear factor. There was a fear factor of contracting the spread of virus amongst investigating team members and also target individuals. Now, in fact, um, several of our investigating officers had also contracted virus during the initial um, period due to close contact with external parties in carrying out enforcement and investigation activities. Now, to address this first challenge, the Commission came up with the Investigation and Enforcement COVID-19 Preventive Measures Guidance. We call it the COVID-19 Preventive Measures Guidance. Now, this guidance outlines the steps to be taken by the investigating officers in carrying out their investigative duties without compromising their health status as well as preventing the spread of COVID-19 during the course of the engagement with the parties. Now, the guidance provides, amongst others, compliance with the health and safety protocols and the SOPs uh, that are to be followed when interacting with external uh, parties, both inside and outside the office. Now, it also included measures to be taken when gathering evidence, measures to be taken during meetings and oral representations. I must say that it, was a fairly, it is a fairly comprehensive uh, guidance. Now, further, to overcome the limitations of having physical meetings and other face-to-face -face engagements, during the pandemic, the investigating team resorted to remote meetings using online technology such as the Zoom and Microsoft Teams. Now, I'm sure other jurisdictions also shared the same thing. Now, since uh, my CC, Malaysian Competition Commission's officers, are fairly young, they quickly adapted to these online meetings. 
Now, the second challenge the team faced during the pandemic was accessing physical documents from the parties under investigation and also relevant parties, witnesses, and this delayed the assessment and of the complaints and investigations. Now, all these years, um, the emphasis had been on physical documents, physical evidence. Now, uh, for example, in pre-pandemic bid rigging investigations, there was so much reliance in obtaining physical tender documents from the procurement agencies. Now, due to the imposition of control order, there was a delay in obtaining relevant documents as the staff of the procurement agencies themselves uh, worked from home. So, to overcome this challenge, the team resorted to digitalization of physical evidence by scanning physical documents so that it is convenient for officers to access the evidence for purposes of investigations. Now, in some cases, the tenders documents um, were published online. So, those tender documents published online were not a problem, uh, were not an issue to get them online. Uh, but in other cases where a reliance is on physical tender documents, uh, during the pandemic, um, the procurement agencies, what they did was when uh, we applied for those documents, they set aside these documents in one special room and uh, will inform our investigating officers that all these documents are in this room. So what our officers do, they go to that room fully equipped um, in accordance to the COVID-19 uh, guidance, and they will go through the documents, and those documents that they are uh, required for the investigation, they will scan them and uh, subsequently uh, carry out investigations based on those documents. So there was this uh, 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 compliance with the preventive measures. They were fully equipped with their masks, their shield, uh, face shield, uh, gloves, uh, and so on. Thank you. I, I think it's, uh, it would be interesting to learn more from the Mexican authority right. about um, any, any issues that you've uh, encountered uh, uh, conducting uh, investigations during the pandemic. Yes. Thank you, Anton, and I am also glad to be here today in, in this plenary session uh, with all of you and also with the rest of my, my fellow panelists. Well, as for everybody, 2020 and 2021 has been really a difficult years and they faced a multiple challenge in the commission owing the COVID-19 restrictions. And in contrast, what uh, happened in our merger investigations that uh, we didn't suspend them. It, they, I mean, since the beginning of the pandemic, it, they, con they were ininterruptedly since uh, we have already have a mandatory use of electronic merger filing system, uh, that didn't happen in our investigations and trial-like procedures. So we have to react uh, promptly, and we have to move to electronic uh, environment. And, uh, we, but at the beginning, uh, to put all this in order, we have to suspend. We have to suspend for, uh, 128 days, and during this time, we have to put everything in, in order because it was necessary uh, to work in the premises, so uh, it was impossible. And, and back then, we didn't have a, a required rules to carry out this remotely. We have to build them. And here I have to explain that uh, COFESE is an autonomous constitutional body with different kind of powers, and some of them are like quasi-legislative. So we were able to, go, to uh, construct our legal framework, and we uh, issue some regulatory provisions. Normally, these uh, regulatory provisions have to, to, f to follow a specific procedure, that is like commission first, have to make a, a draft of the provisions. They are published and they put it in a, in a official gazette and also in our um, website. And all the people that is interested, like um, the economic agents, some of their agent, uh, authorities, maybe academics, they can do their comments to this draft. And it's for 30 days. 
and then we have to receive all these comments, do an inform, and then uh, issue them by the Board of Commissioners, and we have up to 60 days to do that. But like it was an emergency, it, and it is also established in our, in our law, when something like this happened, we are able to uh, issue these uh, emergency regulatory provisions like emergency. So we don't, we skip like this process and we, the Board of Commissioners just uh, issue them. So uh, at, the, at the beginning we issued this to, well, to continue the, the uh, investigations and trial the like procedures, we have to uh, emit these provisions. The first was to make personal notifications by email because we usually do it just in, in person. So we have to, to change to this. Uh, kind of, of tools. And the other um, was the emergency regulatory provisions on the use of electronic means in certain procedures process before the commission. Uh, basically, they established the, the, the rules, the implementation, and uh, it's filing complaints and investigations. And after that, some uh, um, electronic filing office platform uh, was also established. And the way to carry uh, hearings, testimonials, and, conf and confessionals, among other procedures. And in fact, this uh, hearing was uh, not was at, at, at the beginning of, of this uh, regulatory provisions. It was like a lesson because it uh, it wasn't established at the beginning, but uh, when we were uh, conducting one of these investigations. And at the end of the, of, of the investigation or trial like, there's the possibility to have a hearing in front of the board of commissioners and all the economic agents that are related with that are allowed to go. And in one specific case, there were a lot of people and what we wanted is to avoid the contact, the physical contact. So that makes us uh, to have during all this uh, time a reform and we changed that. Uh, after that, well, I, I would say that in spite of this uh, 128 of suspension in our investigations, uh, it doesn't mean that we didn't do anything to, to continue doing something uh, against, for example, cartels. And uh, investigation authority, for example, issue a warning letters. Uh, they were uh, directed to some associations. Uh, one of them was related with sugar and alcohol because uh, prices was, were going up. And as you know, uh, for example, in uh, sanitizing gel, it's necessary also alcohol, so maybe it could be something, and they emit this uh, warning letter. Another example was regarding uh, an association with real estate developers because as maybe it also happened in all other jurisdictions, some of the buildings that were for offices, they, they were vacant or they were empty. And this, uh, uh, this warning letter was uh, about um, to avoid the promotion of, uh, in, the, in the members of this association to determine a quote or maximum discounts in this kind of, of premises. Um, so, and after the suspension, uh, when the suspension ended, uh, we have been able uh, until now to resolve uh, three different cartel uh, cases and also an abuse of, of dominance. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Sweden, what was your experience with the investigations uh, during the pandemic? Well, thank you, Anton, and uh, uh, it's great to be here in Berlin again. And this is my special thanks to our host, the Bundeskartellamt. Well, I would say, apart from the practical problems, uh, the, the pandemic has forced us to consider how we, as a competition authority, uh, should uh, position ourselves uh, and our enforcement work uh, in relation to broader societal issues uh, when deciding how to prioritize our limited investigative resources to the greatest effect. Uh, and this question uh, feels particularly apt uh, in the context of where we are sitting today, since I know that uh, the ICN Agency Effectiveness Working Group has done very useful work in aiding competition authorities in these issues. 
But what we have learned from the pandemic uh, is that we need to continue navigating a steady course uh, through challenging oh, okay. times. Okay, so I just... um, yeah. <laughs> prioritizing our cases uh, based on the fundamental principles that uh, um, all, they have always served us well, and enforcing competition rules robustly. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that we should bury our heads uh, in the sand on what is going on around us. During the pandemic, uh, we kept a close eye on attempts uh, to take advantage of the situation and the crisis uh, to distort competition. Our established prioritization principles, they remained unchanged uh, during the whole pandemic. But at the same time, uh, we acknowledged the fact that we and our authority had a role to play uh, as part of the joint societal effort uh, to address the pandemic. Last year, we investigated uh, a case involving alleged coordination uh, among companies offering PCR tests at the Stockholm's main airport. We had suspicious, uh, suspicions that market actors had agreed to divide up customers um, and not compete on price. Uh, we ultimately closed the investigation um, um, after we found that um, although the companies, they had, uh, had discussions about cooperating in a way that could breach the competition rules, uh, the discussions uh, were discontinued before an agreement came about. And, and the choice to prioritize this investigation, it was not solely because it was related to COVID per se, but based on the nature of the alleged conduct uh, and the potential for, for, for clear consumer harm. Uh, but within that assessment, we weighed in the fact that PCR testing was a new market, uh, it had emerged in a very short time, uh, and that it, it was important to make sure that the market worked well for consumers. And PCR testing uh, was also a service that consumers couldn't refuse in some cases, since it was required to travel to certain destinations. And as markets face new challenges uh, posed by the ramifications of the war in Ukraine, and as inflation hits consumers' pockets, uh, I believe that we need to keep navigating our steady course uh, through these tricky waters. But at the same time, we also need to be able to deliver and be seen to deliver concrete results for consumers. And the issue of how we uh, uh, prioritize our, our enforcement resources has become much more pronounced due to a surge in merger notifications over the last year. I know we are not alone in this, uh, observing this trend uh, in an international context, but we saw a jump from uh, an average about 75 cases a year uh, over the last few years to 137 cases in 2021. And there has been a lot of discussion uh, about whether this is a consequence of, or, of the pandemic or not. However, in Sweden, we did not see a dip in notifications in 2020. Uh, so that explanation doesn't necessarily hold in our case. Whatever the explanation, the increase uh, in resources that we have to place on merger control uh, necessarily has an impact on the number of other investigations that we can pursue. Despite this, uh, I want us to be able to intervene in more cases. And we heard yesterday about how essential it is to have the necessary resources to pursue our mission. And I can only agree with that. Thank you very much. Uh, and now, how about Singapore? Did you have uh, similar issues uh, with uh, investigations? Yeah, thanks, Anton. I think in Singapore, um, our COVID response has been very much similar to what has happened in Malaysia, as shared by Dato Jagjit. Um, we have experienced um, certain phases where there were complete lockdowns, which prevented employees, including our own officers, from returning back to the office. But there was also a gradual relaxation, and that, then we saw a transition into hybrid working arrangements. But these two, uh, these, these, these led to a consequence that officers naturally had to conduct their work, including their investigation works, in a remote manner. Um, 
necessarily that the, the, the investigation works uh, don't focus entirely just on dawn rates, which we'll touch on in a bit, but they also span other aspects, for example, drafting of witness statements, preparing uh, proposed infringement decisions, and even final infringement decisions, and also, um, and I think, um, trying to um, come up with, I review other evidence that is going to be important to the investigation. And the, the, in the context of the triple CS, I think we were fortunate enough um, to have adopted uh, very early on certain IT solutions which allowed our officers to work remotely. Uh, for example, we had an IT platform and a document repository that allowed us to upload documents, access them remotely, review the evidence, as well as allow our officers to um, prepare documents concurrently. Um, and that was actually tremendously useful when we were conducting some of our investigations. Um, there were, of course, certain limitations in terms of um, having to do everything remotely. Like, for example, when it came to interviewing witnesses, I think we felt that it was not entirely feasible to do in, uh, interviews remotely. Some of these uh, interviews, especially with people who are of particular interest, I think had to be done in a face-to-face -face manner so that we can observe the demeanor, observe the micro-reactions to certain questions. And uh, I think uh, to that end, I think having some of these IT solutions did help us in the sense that when we were crafting and recording witness statements, it allowed for the teams to work concurrently on the document while the interviewer poses the questions uh, and, and, and interacts with the witness, other officers are able to then simultaneously record and finalize those answers as they go along so that it speeds up the process and also cuts down the amount of time which the witness and our interviewers need to interact. Uh, so of course we took other measures uh, to, to um, I think one of the important challenges that we faced was not just convincing um, witnesses to come to our office for physical meetings, but also trying to convince our own officers to have to be present for those interviews. And in order to really give everyone the assurance, we've had to necessarily take certain precautions. Uh, we had to do temperature checking prior to commencing an interview. We had to put up plexiglass dividers to allow for some space between interviewers and interviewees, and so on and so forth. So all of these, um, uh, there were certain limitations. We were able to overcome some of them uh, through remote IT solutions. But I think we've also recognized that in the context of investigations, you necessarily have to have some physical interactions, and I think those will not go away. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question to all of you, again, is um, about uh, the so-called down rates, uh, unannounced inspections of uh, business premises. Many agencies have re reported uh, various issues with uh, conducting such um, inspections over the past two years. Can you share your agency's uh, experience uh, in this regard? Okay. Sure, Meng. Yeah. Um, I think just the same as how the lockdown procedures and measures affected our mm -hmm. own agency's officers, just the same, in the same way, it also affected the people whom we were investigating. So naturally, uh, when you go into a lockdown situation, you have to grapple with the challenge of not only being able to, uh, uh, being able to determine the appropriate time and place to conduct a dawn raid, um, when people are working from home, it's not really clear whether uh, they will be in the office on that particular day or whether they're going to be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So that necessarily created a challenge on our part where we had to split up our investigation teams um, to cover more ground, uh, to, cover, to do simultaneous raids, not just on the business premises, but also on the residential premises of the, of the persons who are under investigation. Um, we had to make sure that our officers went there at the same time to verify whether or not a person was in the office or not in the office. And once you've located that person, whether it was uh, at a coffee shop or whether it was uh, at, a, at, a, at their home, uh, we had then had to, of course, tell them to please go back to the business premises or go to our office so that we can conduct our investigations. Um, I think that uh, the, the other reality that we faced was that businesses having transited into working online meant that a lot of the documents may either reside in, some, in someone's home or in a laptop in somebody's home. It could be in the cloud or it could be in uh, some other server. And therefore, we had to also work closely with forensics, uh, um, IT specialists and consultants to be able to go down to take uh, copies of uh, uh, hard drives once you've determined that there could be relevant documents there. And I think working with them to image these documents and hard drives gives us a chance to then again cut down the amount of time that our officers will have to interact with other parties. And, uh, and, and we, of, of course, will naturally give assurances to the parties that we will just take the copies for now, 
But when we do, we will only access these documents later on in your presence or in the presence of your lawyers. So we had to necessarily persuade them that this is a good thing. Uh, it's either that or we're all going to be together in this room for a very, very long time. So I, I think those were some of the challenges that we faced. Okay. Um, what about Mexico? Well, I agree with the difficulties of, of the, <laughs> this. I think we are, all have faced them. And, uh, well, the most affected uh, affected in a tool in investigation surely was down rates. And for example, we weren't able to conduct one from 2020 until the end of 2021. Uh, ju just, just one when we, that was a tool that was really active uh, for, for the investigative authority. And well, we intend to protect our officials, professional officials, and also to protect a potential rate agent. So we decide to not to conduct them for for a long time, and also it it, it was a factor that influenced the decrease of the number of, of leniency applications. Since uh, normally during the uh, during the these applications usually are received in early stages and uh, just after some of these down rates. Uh, but we have uh, during 2021, uh, 2021 uh, to obtain information through other tools like request of information and compulsory interviews. Uh, down, down rates uh, have been gradually resumed and in this year there have been many of them. And we, to pro continue protecting people, we issue an, a protocol uh, at the last of 2021. And it has to, it established that two, two, two things that um, officials from Confesse must have like personal protective equipment, but also the members, uh, the staff that goes to down rates have to be test, tested uh, before and after the down rate. It not only protect them, but it's it, it's also for giving an argue to the to the commission that if the economic agents deny or want to deny because of with the pretext of they can be contagious with a COVID, uh, all the people from Confesse that is going is tested negative before going to the premises to the these economic agents. And it's also like established that uh, the minimum number of members must to go to the to, to the down rates. So the, for implementing this protocol, uh, we had to conduct two public procurement processes. One was, well, to, to buy, to acquire the COVID-19 test. Uh, and basically because of, of this, to protect both and also uh, to avoid the, the protect of refusing uh, the, the visit. And we can, for example, if they refuse, impose a fine. And I think that that uh, makes strong uh, our uh, resolution. Uh, the other public procurement process uh, was carried to make our down rate more efficient. Uh, it was the acquisition of licenses of forensic software in a specific team viewer and Camtasia to allow the remotely copy of information. And this equipment uh, reduced uh, the number of officials that have to participate in the down rates. Uh, so they, uh, they only go the strictly necessary. Uh, the licenses that were acquired uh, are used to uh, internal methodology that the investigative authority developed and they innovate during the pandemic. And it allows to copy information from the location, but from employees that may be outside. For example, you have said that they, they call and you have to come here. They, with this tool that they have developed, it is possible that they just like connect in the, uh, I mean, in the computer in the location of the economic agent, and with this uh, specific, um, um, say equipment uh, for forensic, mm -hmm. they can't like being in the screen, uh, take the video, well, they, uh, they record everything from some of the persons that are not working there, but even uh, overseas. So that's what they have uh, developed during this uh, pandemic. 
Thank you. Uh, was it any different in Sweden doing uh, down rates? Well, <clears throat> uh, I can see, see we, have, uh, we, we have faced uh, more or less the same challenges uh, in many ways. But uh, at the outset of the pandemic, uh, we had to initially had to postpone some, some uh, investigative measures. Uh, since it, it was not really feasible um, to carry them out given the, the public health situation and, and work from home recommendations and so forth. Uh, however, as time progressed, uh, we were ultimately able to successfully carry out dawn raids, uh, not only for our own authority, um, but also on behalf of another authority, national authority in the EU, since you all know we can help each other with dawn raids. Uh, and there were, there were n numerous novel factors uh, that we needed to consider. Uh, since companies uh, may also have been working from home, as they did, uh, as we heard from Singapore's experience, uh, this placed much greater demands on us in the planning stages. Much more uh, planning need was needed. Uh, and we also had to have uh, a, uh, an increased preparedness uh, for stand-ins from our own staff who could participate uh, at short notice in case uh, our staff developed symptoms, which they did. Uh, and in terms of execution of dawn raids, uh, our on-site team followed very strict sanitary protocols, of course, and ensured uh, a very clear uh, communication with the company uh, about the public health measures taken. And, and that worked very well, I would say. Uh, but, of course, we also needed to, to take into account uh, how to handle the absence of key persons uh, from the premises that we were respecting. Uh, this was, of course, not new to the pandemic, but potentially much more common than before. You don't know where the people are, to be honest. Uh, and we also carried out uh, dawn raids where our IT forensic staff could connect to the case team remotely. So they could assist with forensic work uh, without having to be uh, at the offices of the undertaking. And this meant uh, that we could keep the number of staff to a minimum on site. Uh, and of course, because of the overriding imperative of limiting uh, uh, our presence on site as much as possible, uh, we made use of um, uh, legislative amendments that were introduced last year uh, that allows the authority, under certain circumstances, to remove original materials to carry out searches on the authority's premises, uh, rather than carrying out uh, um, uh, the search or copying of data on site. Uh, we made use of this tool twice uh, during the pandemic, uh, and the main rationale for this uh, was the fact that the SCA was inspecting private premises, uh, and we must always strive to avoid unnecessary uh, intrusion, of course. With that said, uh, the right of the subject of, uh, of the inspection not to be burdened unnecessarily is, of course, an important consideration for us. Uh, and all else being equal, we should choose the least burdensome intervention uh, during dawn raids. And under normal circumstances, making a copy of a hard disk uh, for the purpose of searching it uh, at the authority's premises, that would be less burdensome than taking the hard disk itself. Therefore, uh, the decision during the pandemic, uh, I would say, would, would generally be considered as the exception rather than the rule. And some of these factors are likely to stay relevant uh, uh, for some time. Companies, they are still implementing hybrid work-from-home policies. Uh, and one of the challenges now is that key persons, they may not just be working from the home, but from their summer cottage or winter cottage and so forth. <laughs> uh, and they do. They <laughs> book <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> they do. And I mean, we have uh, also, we have public health recommendations uh, still require us uh, that we stay at home if we de develop symptoms, uh, COVID and so forth. So our staff <laughs> needs to be, remain extra vigilant. Uh, but I say the remote participation of our IT staff that we implemented during the pandemic, that, that <coughs> might not become universal um, uh, in the future, but it could be used uh, when appropriate, particularly as we uh, begin to draw on lessons from the pandemic about how to 
reduce our, our, our carbon footprint as well from travel. Ultimately, one important lesson learned uh, is that to ensure effective dawn rates, we need to have effective tools at our disposal. Uh, and the, uh, the introduction last year of the common minimum rules within the EU has made us much better equipped uh, to carry out these measures, whether in the middle of, of a pandemic or not. Thank you. Well, let's wrap up this second round of questions with uh, one for Malaysia. That objective. <clears throat> Thank you, Anton. Uh, now, um, Malaysia also faced similar issues that have been raised by uh, Singapore swimming. And um, of course, the primary, uh, primary issue was uh, that uh, no evidence was no longer kept at the company's premises. We find that um, because of the new culture of work from home, uh, evidence was found uh, all over the place. Uh, key employees' uh, homes. Uh, if, uh, there was a case where we even found, every, uh, uh, through our surveillance, evidence was found uh, at a place where um, employees meet to play poker. So, so that was also um, another case. Now, to overcome all these uh, challenges, um, what we had to do was to expand our surveillance and to um, find out who are the key uh, employees, key personnel, and where is all this uh, 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 evidence kept? Now, um, the other issue um, that Malaysia faced um, during dawn raids, uh, during partial lockdown, was that only 30% of our enforcement investigation officers were allowed to work from office. The rest had to work from home. So there, were, there was a constrained uh, shortage of manpower. Now, what uh, we did was, to overcome this uh, challenge, uh, we collaborated with other enforcement agencies under what we term as smart strategic enforcement uh, concept. That is to carry out surveillance and investigations and including dawn rates. Now, one example is where both uh, uh, our Malaysian Competition Commission and the Anti-Corruption Commission jointly investigated a bid-rigging case that had elements of corruption involving public officials. Now, in that case, both the commissions had uh, coordinated the raids and the investigation, including sharing of information. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, we've had a very interesting uh, discussion so far. And since um, we don't have much time left, I would like to invite you to, for a couple of uh, closing remarks, maybe just answer this uh, general question that I have in mind. What tools or changes uh, to conducting investigations um, are you going to keep keep using after the pandemic? Just briefly, uh, Brenda? Well, I think there's no going back to in-paper or in-person procedures. So we have to take these uh, two years of experience and to to reveal, uh, and for example, in Mexico with this, uh, to, well, this uh, emergency disposition we have, they are just effective during the pandemic. So when it ends, we have to, uh, with the normal or proper procedure I have explained, to issue another one. The problem that is that for that, the, it's that specific quasi-legislative uh, faculty that we have uh, must to be uh, de um, developed with the at least five votes of the commissioners. And the problem is that now we are four. So if, for example, the government says the, the pandemic is over, those won't be affected anymore, and we couldn't be uh, capable to issue the new ones, the ones that are not like these, that are optional, because we want to give them mandatory. So we need to to be complete. And regarding this, we have a, a file a constitutional controversy uh, to the uh, Constitu Supreme Court in order that it uh, determined that executive branch has to uh, complete the the process to the three vacancies that we have. But well, for example, something that will continue is that we have also developed during the, this pandemic the electronic signature uh, for internal documents as also for, for example, the resolution. And that's 
surely will continue. Oh, um, yes, I, I think Brenda is absolutely right. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly slayed a number of sacred cows for companies. And it used to be the belief that you should be in the office to do your work. I think that's, we have gone past that completely. Um, I think the hybrid working arrangements are here to stay. Uh, so certainly it would impose a greater burden on investigation agencies in, some, in terms of having to split up your investigation and rate teams in order to do simultaneous rates on multiple premises, which would include residential premises as well. Um, I think we've also, um, we are looking uh, with great interest into areas such as um, the ability to conduct uh, remote inspections of documents uh, via IT solutions. Um, we will also be quite interested to learn from other agencies how they've conducted remote interviews, but I necessarily have some reservations about remote interviews. I mean, I've mentioned some of them earlier. Um, one other area that we are looking at would be e-statements. I think the electronic statements are, um, we, we are looking at it as a means to essentially cut down the amount of time that we will have to um, write down uh, long, lengthy statements from a person who we are interviewing. Um, the electronic statements will also have a certain additional benefit in the sense that they would create a digital log of the interview process itself um, allow for the court, if necessary, to see the various stages that were undertaken as part of the investigation or the interview so that um, witnesses are not able to subsequently say, I've never seen this statement in my life. Uh, I, I was not given an appropriate break. Uh, I was not afforded uh, any um, amenities during the course of the interview. So I think as part of the electronic statement, we will not just um, allow us to record statements faster, but it would also hopefully generate a uh, authenticated log from the witness himself or herself so that we are able to capture some of these information and reduce the chances of subsequent challenges when we you know, go for a hearing. Thank you. Dr. Jagjit. Oh, thank you. Now, um, from our experience, uh, the takeaways uh, from this pandemic is that there, there will be continued reliance on remote investigations. We cannot run away from it. Uh, there will be um, statement recordings through online video conferencing, despite weaknesses um, that come along with it. Now, um, you see, uh, one case uh, I can share with you uh, is that where my officers uh, called in an individual to come in for statement recording. And uh, when that individual was called, uh, first thing he asked was, uh, look, can you guarantee me that if I come into your office that I will not contract COVID-19? Now, how can uh, we assure, my CC assure that? We can't even assure that our own officers don't contract COVID-19. How can we uh, give him such a guarantee? So then he then uh, said that, okay, I will come in because of the order, but if I contract uh, COVID-19, I'm going to sue my CC. So that's the sort of situations that we are facing uh, currently. So... Um, a remote investigation is there, uh, is going to be expanded, it will be expanded further. Now, the other um, aspect is, of course, surveillance and uh, dawn rate strategies uh, will continue to be expanded, and uh, now it will be uh, expanded to include homes of key personnel to be raided, as work from home uh, arrangement is a new norm that is going to stay with us. Yeah, right. Thank you. And finally, Sweden. Well, <clears throat> I can very much echo my, my fellow panelists on, on these uh, matters. Uh, one observation from our side is that uh, during the pandemic, we were party to a, a joint statement uh, of the European Competition Network, where we, among other things, offered the opportunity uh, to companies um, uh, for informal guidance uh, on necessary and temporary uh, cooperation to address shortages of supply or caused by the pandemic. Uh, and although this type of uh, informal guidance is uh, rather the exception than the rule for us, we recognize the importance uh, and relevance of uh, collectively offering clarity about the application of, of our rules. Uh, unfortunately, due uh, to current tragic events, we now see echoes uh, of these steps that we took over two years ago at the start of the pandemic. Uh, we are now party to a joint statement on the application of competition law in the context of the war in Ukraine. 
where the ECN has offered to be available for informal guidance uh, regarding necessary and temporary measures speci specifically targeted at avoiding severe disruptions caused by the impact of the war and uh, or sanctions uh, on the internal market. So this is clear. Uh, it is a clear example of how, uh, how those processes and, and routines that we put in place during the pandemic continue uh, to have a lasting relevance for our enforcement work in, in times of crisis, I'm sorry to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for this um, insightful uh, discussion. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has obviously affected uh, many aspects of our personal and professional lives. And similarly, as we just heard, um, competition agencies were not spared either and had to adapt their investigative uh, processes to the new realities. We have learned a great deal today about the challenges uh, you faced, how you approached them and the solutions you found. Um, let me offer you what I think are the three main lessons that we've learned and lessons that we could uh, continue using in the future. First, um, it appears that di digitalization and hybrid uh, work arrangements are here to stay. There's no going back. Second, it's uh, important to cooperate even more closely with uh, agencies at home as well as internationally. And third, agencies should endeavor to meet societal needs by actively and effectively prioritizing their cases. Again, thank you all, and please join me in a round of applause for our speakers.